Richard Trudeau, whose last sermon was Lucky Mud, tells this story in his recent book, Universalism 101. Hosea Ballou, leader of the Universalist denomination for the first half of the 19th century, was in his younger days a circuit rider, and he would ride from town to town to preach the Universalist gospel. Well, Baptists were also circuit riders, and one day he was riding alongside a, a Baptist circuit rider, and they were discussing theology on their way, as ministers are wont to do. They had a friendly theological debate. The Baptist was flabbergasted to learn that universalists don't believe in a God who would condemn people to eternal hellfire. Why, if I were a universalist, he said, I could knock you over the head, ride off with your money and horse, and have nothing to worry about. If you were a universalist, replied Baloo, the thought would never occur to you. I need to say, by the way, that I'm very much indebted to Richard's book for this sermon, and if anyone would like to borrow it to learn more, you are welcome, because I still have my Kindle version. <coughs> and I'm very indebted both for some nice anecdotes and also for his very clear argument for the importance of honoring and learning from our universalist forebears. Part of why it's important to lift up the universalist part of our heritage today is because it reminds us that our movement sprung from Christian roots. Both sides of our UU faith, Unitarians and Universalists, were forged within Christianity and a Christianity at that time of a somewhat forbidding type, deeply influenced by Calvinism. And this dour variant of Christian doctrine taught that human beings are utterly depraved, every single one of them. It taught that we are born in sin and that most of us will die in sin and there's nothing we can do about it and we will end up suffering in hellfire for eternity. The most vivid expression is one that some of you may have studied in school, the sermon in the mid-1740s by Jonathan Edwards whose title was Sinners in the hands of an angry God. He vividly compares each human being to that of a, st a spider held by the merest tiny thread over the fiery pit of hell by God, whom God could, with a mere twitch of his finger, release to eternal damnation. Now, most of you probably did not grow up in churches that taught that God is an angry God. But many of you did grow up in Christian churches, and all of you grew up surrounded in one form or another by a Christian culture. If you're Jewish, you may have suffered some insults from Christians. Some Jews, even to this day, even as recently as about five months ago on a, on a, a basketball court, some Jews were jeered and denounced as Christ killers. So we all have been influenced in one way or another by Christianity, whether as insiders or outsiders. And many of us carry scars of one sort or another from that influence, from that experience. And some of us carry fond memories and wonder how that religious tradition behind our current situation might influence, might fit into our living Unitarian Universalist tradition. Many of us are come-outers, as I am, who left the religion of our childhood or perhaps young adulthood to join a more liberal faith. And many of us came out because we were wounded by those experiences. Many of us are very clear why we left and we still carry anger and hurt in our hearts because of what we were taught, what we were forced to learn, how we were treated. So among us, it's very easy to find folks who condemn Christianity lock, stock, and barrel. And it's somewhat fashionable to speak within our circles and wonder why anyone could possibly believe that. Who, 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 how could anyone with half a brain in their head be so stupid as not to see that it's all a myth? There's nothing to all that gobbledygook that we have the truth and they are blind. But that anger is reactive. That anger is what got us out. 
But when it still burns in us, when we're still outraged by where we come from, we might find that there's a part of us, a part of what has formed who we are today, that still lies deep inside us, but only as something that we've rejected. Maybe we were estranged from relatives or former friends who were upset because we came out. Maybe we don't talk to some of our family because of that. Is there anyone here who was raised in a Protestant church? Yeah. Uh, any Catholics among us? Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is this part of Massachusetts, so there are more Catholics than Protestant. Jews? Yeah. Uh, people who grew up with no religion, unchurched. Is anyone still angry about the religion that they grew up in? Is anyone still wondering if there might be at least a little truth in the way that you were brought up religiously? Yeah. That's where the universalist side of our tradition comes in. I want to show you an image that was created by some universalist leaders in 1946 and adopted by the Massachusetts Universalist Convention in 1947. It's, it's the off-center cross, and here's how Richard describes its meaning. The circle represents the universe. The empty space in the center represents the mystery at the heart of the universe that people call God. The cross represents Christianity, one path toward God, and the path from which universalism and Unitarianism has grown. It's off to the side to leave room for other points of view and to acknowledge the validity of other paths towards God. I know it's shocking to see a cross in a Unitarian Universalist congregation. I should probably have given you a trigger warning. <laughs> but I want to suggest that this is a healing symbol. It allows us to acknowledge where many of us, most of us, came from personally, but also where our faith traditions come from. It tells us that the Christian tradition is not the only source of truth about the nature of our lives, the universe and everything, but it is one source. It tells us that we can accept the part of ourselves that stems from those roots. We say we have many sources for our living UU tradition, but we often exclude the most relevant source of all, Christianity. And we easily revere the teachings of the Buddha, the Tao Te Ching, Tao Te Ching or the Hindu scriptures, but we often have an allergic reaction when Jesus is equally honored. I know I don't speak for all of you, but I do speak for myself, and I have a hunch there are those among you who wrestle with issues like this as well. The off-center cross is one representation of the faith that universalism brought to our movement when the Unitarians and Universalists married in 1961 to create our Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. Five of the six members of that new association were Unitarians, so the Universalist message was easy to overlook and was on the whole forgotten for many years after the merger. Thanks, Alan. The message of Universalism is very simple. God is love, no one is condemned, the way to be happy is to do good, and there are sources of truth outside the Christian tradition. I know there are a lot of allergies out there to the God part of that simple faith, and there are Unitarian Universalist congregations where the use of that word is virtually forbidden. In my first Unitarian Universalist congregation, the Unitarian Society of Ridgewood, New Jersey, a guest minister referred to God in the sermon and the president of the congregation at the end of the sermon rose and said, in this society, we don't say God, we say instead good. And we spell devil without the D. And when Sarah Lambert became our minister in 2002, she unrolled a long sheaf of computer paper on which she had written the words that she was forbidden to say from the pulpit. 
God, Jesus, sin, church, and so on. Richard Trudeau describes his own experience of coming to terms with the word this way. A.J. Mathil Jr., one time minister of Liberty Church near Louisville, Mississippi, once said, God is a name my heart gives to the mystery of the universe, the mystery in the center of that off-center cross. That struck a chord with me, Richard says. I thought, there's a God that certainly exists. There is a mysteriousness about life. And that's what people are grappling with when they use the word God. God is the X of life's equation, the meaning we seek, the answer we long for. And the all too human mistake that humanism saves us from is thinking that we know the answer that the name God represents. And then secondly, no one is condemned. This is where universalism departs most from the Calvinist tradition of Jonathan Edwards and his sinners in the hands of an angry God. The Universalists realized that if God is love, as is said in the first epistle of John, then God is not an angry God. No loving father would want to see his children suffer an eternity of fiery punishment. Although many loving fathers on some occasions might be tempted to wish for a little punishment as a reminder to their children not to get too muddy. No, don't get me wrong. Universalists don't believe in original sin or in the utter depravity of every single person. But that doesn't mean that we're perfect. Let me defang sin a little bit. One interpretation of the Hebrew word for sin is missing the mark, falling short. We may not be subject to original sin, but a child doesn't have to be very old before they show signs of missing the mark. And no matter how short of the mark anyone may fall, no one is condemned. No one is going to be dropped from that slender thread into a pit of hellfire. No one is beyond redemption. Everyone is forgiven. Each one of us is the child of a loving God. And when we know that we can be forgiven, we gain the strength and the gratitude to forgive others as well. That's good news. And the way to be happy is to do good. When we realize that we can be forgiven when we miss the mark, we can turn away from the selfishness that causes us so often to miss the mark, to sins against ourselves and others. And we find that we can turn toward doing good. We can learn to love our neighbors as ourselves. We can learn that true happiness in life comes not from pleasing ourselves, but from taking our part in healing this broken world and our broken relationships. So where do these universalists come from? The center of the congregational churches from which this congregation sprang and from which Unitarianism grew was, was primarily oriented around Boston. And it was primarily in the larger towns and in the cities. Universalism came out of the rural areas of New England centered in New Hampshire where Hosea Ballou was born. And it's said that Unitarianism spread out across the rail lines as they connected towns and cities, while universalism was spread on horseback. Many of the universalists came out of Baptist traditions and carried with them much of the enthusiasm of Baptist services. Now, as Reverend Rachel mentioned, I was among the Baptists last night. We were celebrating Pastor Michael Wayne Walker's 35 years of service the congregation and we were also beginning to bid him farewell as he prepares to leave Messiah in October to return to his roots in Texas and to care for his ailing parents. Sister Betty and Sister Rachel and I were there and so was Brother Ed Hardy who spoke in honor of Pastor Walker in the Baptist style. Now Baptists have a responsive style of preaching. Can I get an amen? Amen. Baptist preachers share the gospel with enthusiasm and vigor and their congregations urge them along. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. 
So we need to imagine the origins of universalism somewhere in the 1770s in the less citified parts of New England, emerging out of an enthusiastic tradition with their newfound revelation that God is love and that we are free from the burden of condemnation, that we can be joyful because we are forgiven. Amen? Amen. Our congregation right here was founded 300 years ago. Happy birthday to us. Can you say that? Happy birthday to us. <laughs> this congregation at that time was the only church in town, so its leaders were also the leaders of the town, the folks of quality, we might say. And this congregation's ministers were educated at Harvard. Universalist preachers came from the plow to the pulpit. They spoke from inspiration. This congregation's ministers spoke from erudition. Come to think of it, they still do. So there was joy in their worship, something like the joy our Baptist brothers and sisters share. Unitarians insisted on the importance of the use of reason in religion, rejecting on those grounds the Trinity, which they regarded as irrational, while universalism's distinctive doctrine was the insistence that no one will be condemned to eternal damnation, that salvation is universal, that God is love. And this compassion for all was characterized by Robert Ingersoll, the atheist, as a religion where they believe in a God who leaves the latch string out until the last child comes home. Thomas Starr King served both Unitarian and Universalist congregations, and he was credited by Abraham Lincoln with keeping California from seceding from the Union with his tireless preaching in support of the Union speaking up and down at the start of the Civil War of the state of California. He summarized the difference between our two ancestral traditions by saying that Unitarians believe that they are too good for God to condemn to hell, <laughs> while the Universalists believe that God is too good to condemn anyone to hell. <laughs> Ambrose Bierce, in his Devil's Dictionary, offered these definitions of our traditions. Unitarian, one who denies the divinity of a Trinitarian. Universalist, one who forgoes the advantage of hell for persons of another faith. Unitarianism can sometimes tempt us to be proud folks. And that also comes from our heritage of educated clergy and leadership by the finest people of the town. Universalism preaches that all are equal in the sight of God. Unitarianism taught salvation by character, that we must cultivate ourselves to become good people. And God knows we do need to cultivate our own and our children's character. But universalism teaches us to be more humble, to remember that we are human, all too human. And Universalist congregations therefore welcome people from all walks of life, from all ranks and classes, not just the best people. There's a story told of a couple of Unitarian ladies who uh, have a guest in their church and she admires their hats. And the visitor says, where, where do you get those beautiful hats? And the response is, Unitarian ladies know where to get the right hats. <laughs> we need a little more spirit among our Unitarian Universalists today. We need a little more willingness to welcome everyone from every walk of life, from every corner of our towns, from high class to low class. Can I get an amen? amen. The good news of Universalism reminds us that we miss the mark more than we might wish. It reminds us that we fail to achieve our highest aspirations more often than not. And it assures us that no matter how far we might fall, there is grace to lean on to bring us back into the fold. There is joy to be had in sharing burdens and in doing good among us and out in the world around us. We are not alone and we do not have to be perfect to be good. Amen? We are not on our own, not even muddy children who are graciously forgiven and put back on the right path to being clean again over and over again. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to perfect our character. There's forgiveness for us no matter how far we stray. 
And that's good news. That's joyful news. That's news about healing and transformation. There is grace, amazing grace, available to each of us. Knowing that can give us joy. Knowing that can happify us, as Hosea Ballou described the work we do here together. There is grace, amazing grace, and we can be thankful and grateful for it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. 